if you're ready, let's uh, open our Bibles to Titus. We're going to continue our study through uh, this pastoral epistle. Uh, like Nehemiah, Pat laid a very good foundation uh, last month uh, that hopefully we'll be able to build upon. You guys knew I was going to throw a Nehemiah reference in there just because uh, it's, it's my pattern. But uh, before we do that, let's, uh, let's jump in, let's pray, and uh, we'll get our, ourselves going this morning. Lord, we, we pray for your supernatural caffeination this morning, that you would wake us up, alert our minds and our hearts, our spirits, Lord, to you. We pray that we would be in tune with all the things that you desire for us and from us, Lord, that our hearts would be yours right now, that our minds would be attentive and sensitive to the things that you have for each of us. Lord, corporately, individually, as you see fit, and uh, cause us to, to see things that we need to hear, and Lord, to be encouraged, to be strengthened, to be edified, so that we may walk out our faith, that we may live out uh, this Christian life through you, with you, by you, for you, Lord. And we thank you for this time to gather as men and to do this study and to fellowship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we have, uh, we're, we're, we're transitioning from uh, kind of this introduction that we had last month to a section that is relatively practical, very instructive as it relates to establishing churches, as it relates to church leadership and the things that are required of church leadership. And this could sound terribly self-serving as I'm talking about the position in which I hold, you know, as a pastor, elder, leader, um, you know, the, the, the Tesla that we just passed for me in the budget is nothing compared to the private jet for the pastor down the street. So, uh, you know, um, and the love offering we take later in the service for, uh, for such will uh, just, anyhow, the, th this section is very practical. There's, there's no reason to be sheepish here. You know, as, as you consider what our culture may think as somebody were to walk into our church, from off the streets, not having a church background. They may look around and go, why are you guys gathering in rows? Why on Sundays do you sing songs? Why, what is a sermon? Why do you do sermons? Why is a sermon that long? Why is it that short? What, why aren't there all songs? Why, you know, what is it, why do you do the things that you do? And, and, and these are very practical instructions for what it, how, how it relates to doing church. And in church, there are some things that are foundational, non-negotiable. There are some things that uh, we have freedom to do. There are some things that we might call common graces that you say, okay, well, you know, you can do it your way and we're going to do it our way. The Bible gives us freedom in those areas. And, and we have to distinguish those things. And one of the qualifying factors, one of the things that are very uh, non-negotiable is, is church leadership and the qualifications of an elder, pastor, bishop, overseer. All these words are very interchangeable within the framework of the New Testament. And, uh, but, you know, you think about things of like the, the things that are most non-negotiable, those things like, you know, that are found in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, the apostles' doctrine, the teaching of God's word, prayer, fellowship, the breaking of bread. Those things are very uh, much described, very things, things that are very prescribed within the context of the New Testament. And you have things that are, are common graces. Think about, well, do you do Sunday school? Do you do home groups? Do you sing old songs or do you sing new songs? And Or do you sing songs at all? Well, I don't know if that that's really negotiable, but, uh, you, you know, do you have concrete floors or carpet? Do you, you know, these things are all negotiable as it relates to the New Testament. Now, churches will go to war over these things and, you know, you know, spit in your eye and all of a sudden you have a divided church over who over the nonsense I, I attended a, a Baptist church and we had worship wars you know we had a young generation that wanted the new stuff you had the older generation that wanted the and, and and the two we had to divide up into two different churches you know you had one service that was for the hymns and one for the new stuff and you couldn't have anything any meeting in the middle somewhere 
But uh, as we look at this text, we're going to see again that the, the one non-negotiable is qualified leadership. And leadership is, is something that the Lord wants to be unified and uniform in his church. Wherever you go, you should find qualified leadership. And it's not, it's not always the case, unfortunately. It's not always the case. You know, I was just reading the autobiography of uh, Booker T. Washington, and he s spoke of the uh, state of the pulpit, the state of the churches in the uh, mid-18th uh, 1800s and, and how there was, you know, in, in the area he was describing, there was, you know, hundred, you know, a hundred churches. And he said each of these churches had 30 elders and 10 members, you know, and, and, and he said none of them were qualified from a biblical perspective. You had all, all uh, chefs, but no cooks in all of these churches. And, and unfortunately, you know, you, not everybody takes the scriptures as serious as others. So we're going to spend time looking at verses 5 through 16, and they all kind of uh, circle around this particular topic. And you can break them down into three different tranches. If you look at verse 5, verse 5 tells us why, why Titus was there. What is Titus's role and job? He was there to establish order and to appoint elders. And then the second tranche would be verses six through nine. What are the character traits that each one of these elders should possess? What are those qualifying factors? And then the third tranche would be verses 10 through 16. Who is it that you're ministering to? The culture, the people, uh, why you're called there and who you're going to be ministering to. And in this case, it is a rough bunch. It is, this is like, you know, Las Vegas meets uh, Cancun. It's an island culture that is just a wild party and bunch. And it's, the, the going's going to be tough. So, uh, but what, let's dive in. Let's look at why Titus was there. We're going to read verse five. And there it says, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Uh, so these churches are newly established here, verse 5. Uh, again, Pat identified last month, and we're going to read in verse 12 and 13. Man, these are, this is a, a very carnal culture, beach town, and Paul is leaving Titus to set things in order, to, to leave him behind, to, to bring that which is in chaos right now into order. In fact, uh, he uses the term, to, to the, the word there that says to uh, set in order, or pardon me, to uh, put to order is the word set, to set, and it was a medical term. It was the same term that you would use in that medical community to set a bone, to set a, uh, a limb that was out of joint, something that was broken. Uh, I know I'm looking at a few Cowboy fans. You guys know, remember seeing Dak Prescott's uh, injury, right? You know, like, wow, you know, and, and none of us who've ever broke a bone want Nurse Ratchet taking care of us, right? You, you want somebody with some gentleness and tenderness and some authority, somebody who is going to be strong but tender to take care of you. And, and, and Titus is being left behind to, to tenderly but firmly establish order in this town. And, uh, you know, it, it requires a, a firm and a tender hand. Uh, notice that he says, I want you to appoint elders in every town. And this is not a, a suggestion for Titus. This isn't something merely as a good idea as, a, well, there's several scenarios for you that could work out. You know, maybe, maybe the congregation could get together and vote on what they should do, or maybe that, you know, what would be a good idea is you should take a survey. No, he says what, my, what God's plan is, is for you to establish elders. That's the plan. There is a plan for how to establish the church. This is a command. It is a distinctive of the Christian church as seen in the whole of the New Testament, as prescribed here, as prescribed in 1 Timothy the chapter 3. And Paul's saying it's important for you to understand that these men are here to make sure uh, that there are qualified leadership established in every church. 
And again, you know, uh, this, this may seem self-serving, but this, it, it, the reality is, is there's a serious charge as it, the, as it applies to those who desire to lead God's church, for those who want to be teachers. Uh, we all, you know, my mind automatically goes to James chapter 3. It says, you know, not many of you should uh, desire the office of teacher, become a teacher, for you know that teachers will be held to a stricter judgment. Uh, Jesus warns of some of these things, you know, in, in Luke chapter 12, where he said, uh, to whom much is given, from him much is required. You guys thought that was Uncle Ben from Spider-Man. That's true, too. But he was quoting scripture. But these, these men, these elders, are functioning as part of God's order within the life and the ministry of any given church. And it's not so you can walk into a church and go, oh, okay, well, the, the, the elders and the pastors, they get, they get the green jacket, like, you know, they won the masters. And, and well, you know, the, the deacons, they get the yellow jacket, you know, like the NFL Hall of Famers, and, and everybody else is a second-class citizen within the church. It's not that at all. There's a role there's a price and there's a call on their life in which they are to, to meet. And there's a stricter judgment at the end of the day that is meeting them. So what are these qualifications? What does this look like? Well, verse 6, the second tranche, uh, the qualifications. We're going to spend some time. There's, I tell you what, it, he just boom, 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 goes at it, you know, one after the other. But we're going to take some time and just look through these, uh, hopefully, as quickly as we can. Verse 6 through 9, we're going to read, If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and, the, and his children are believers, and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Paul, take a breath for crying out loud. He's just, he's got to be, you got to do, you got to be, you got to be. Like, okay, ch chill. Let me catch my breath and my thought pattern as it relates to any of these things. Verse 9, he says he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So, so let's just talk, you know, in, in, in layman's terms about these. Notice the first thing he mentions. He mentions it once. He actually mentions it twice, being above reproach. The word there means uh, that nothing take hold upon. Uh, the idea here is that mud will be slung it's, it's the person of moral character who the mud doesn't stick to. And, and the reality is, unfortunately, you know, as we often say, ministry is a people business. And unfortunately, in ministry, there's a lot of, lot of mud slung, whether intentionally or unintentionally. There's some unintentional dragons out there, but they sling a lot of mud. And the reality is, is the, 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 the man that is after God's heart, the man that God is looking for to lead his church is a man who's unsoiled by all the mud slinging. He must remain righteous in the midst of a generation that is untoward, that is crooked, that is uh, full of, of, of carnal thinking and patterns. Uh, there must be no grievous sin that this leader uh, has, uh, has taken hold of his life and therefore would leave an attack open for the church. Notice verse uh, six also said that he's husband of one wife. The idea here, he's a, he's a one woman man. He, he's not a Don Juan. He's not a, a flirt. He's not a, a, you know, taking an interest. He's not a guy who's doing the double and triple take. You know, when he's out and about, he's got eyes for his wife. Uh, in that culture, prostitution was prolific uh, most people who were of any affluence had uh, male and female servants, as it were. I'm being very nice as I say that. Attendants, you may say. That was very common in uh, that culture. But this leader is, is to uh, not show any romantic or sexual interest uh, to anyone, male or female, including depictions of it as it relates to pornography. It's not to say that leaders can't be uh, or have to be married, you know. 
Uh, if you read this, you go, well, wait a second, you know, what about Paul? Was he, well, he was, there's some indications he was married, but it doesn't seem that, that his wife stuck around when he was called into ministry. Uh, what about Jesus? Yeah, I don't think we can make, we, we're the bride of Christ, but besides that, there was no, so Jesus and Paul would be dis disqualified if you guys try carrying that theological, you know, uh, you know, uh, tone and, and, and you follow that to its logical conclusion. It doesn't, doesn't add up. But the idea that's here is that uh, love and affection has been given to one woman. That is your wife. That's where it belongs. Uh, and that's where it stays. Verse 6, notice it says, and his children are believers, not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. Uh, again, in, in, in Paul's uh, letter to Timothy in chapter 3, it says, For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? So, the God, so godly leadership demonstrates his ability first at home. That's where it starts. Paul recognizes that the home is where Christianity is first practiced. This is where we first demonstrate our faith. These are the proving grounds. You know, you're at your house, you get practice all week long, you know, and, and if you have children, you know that that is a trial. If you are married to somebody, you, you're a, a, a sinner married to another sinner trying to walk out your faith, man, there's no greater struggle to, to living with somebody who God has made as an instrument unto your death. And, and, and I mean death, not as in physical death. If, if that's the case, you need to get out quick. But I mean your, your, the death of yourself, the death of the me, myself, and I, my self-willed nature. And God's put that person in your life till you learn how to die to yourself. And that's a challenge. But that's where our faith is to be lived out. It, it's hard. Children rebel. And, and the reality is, is, you know, this is not speaking about, obviously, adult children. Adult children get out and make their own decisions. But while they're living under your roof, uh, the reality is, is uh, they're to live in, under your subjection, under your rule. And we all deal with it. I counsel people all the time. You know, I just can't get my child to do this. Well, you know, I'm reminded Hebrews tells us that God chastises those he loves. He disciplines. He he applies the uh, hand of wisdom to the seed of knowledge uh, to those he loves. And I, I've been taken behind the woodshed a number of times. And I'm not, God's never called a man to be a bully or, or violent. And, and if that's you right now, I'm just going to tell you you're a coward and, and you need to knock it off. I want to state that clearly. I'm not trying to insinuate child abuse is something that you you should do and, and, and hear me, you know, joking around about spanking kids. If you're a bully, if you're an abuser, knock it off. There's no room for that. It's an act of cowardice. But uh, as we, we continue to look, notice it says that for an overseer, as God's steward, one must be above reproach. He uses the term above reproach again for a second time. And, uh, you know, I don't know about you guys. I, I, you know, I'm helping my kids take their classes. And when you see something uh, or you hear a teacher say it twice, that means it's going to be on the test, right? That means it's, you're going to be charged with knowing that. So knowing what above reproach, again, not letting that mud stick. And uh, notice that it's a, you're to be a steward, just like a parent, just like a parent is only a steward of their children, right? You're a steward over that child for a number of years. And then they're the Lord's that you, we serve a Lord who, who rules over our gajillion bazillion years. And he gives us this tiny fraction of time in which we are to raise our children and to, to impart to them faith and disciplines. And they're his ultimately that they'll go off out from out under our roof and to the next Eternity in the chapter ahead of us. They are his children. We are temporary students, our stewards, pardon me, of his resources and of his people. And that's where you are as an overseer. You are a temporary steward of his people and his resources. So you must be above reproach. Notice that verse 7 also says that you must not be. Notice that it says he must not be arrogant. I just want to point that out that is affirming what has already been said in um, 
uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, that he's speaking to men here. I think that uh, that's another subject for another day, but he says that he must not be arrogant. And I like the, the original language when you look here is a little bit more colorful or specific. The Greek word there means to be self-willed or self-pleasing. The idea here is that selfish people disqualify themselves from ministry because you cannot bring to the ministry or to church leadership your own personal agenda. You can't have your, your own agenda at, at, at heart when it comes to leading God's people. Uh, I've told this story many a time, uh, you know, I remember being at this place of, of yearning for discipleship. We had taken every, you know, we, would gone, we went to every Bible study at this church we were going to. We attended anything that they called discipleship. We were there and we were, we were you know, knocking on doors, calling people. We were trying to, you know, just integrate into the church and get to know and, and try to understand this Jesus. We were being challenged by every in every direction for, with our faith. And we were looking for answers. And, and we were praying that somebody would take us under their wing. And finally, the chairman of the, the, uh, the deacon board, who was also an elder at our church, called us and, and, and asked us if we wanted to do dinner. He ended up inviting himself over for dinner. That was the first sign that this was going to be awkward. But anyway... <clears throat> so we thought, thank you, Lord, finally, finally, there's somebody who's taking an interest in us. Thank you, Lord, there's going to be somebody who wants to disciple us and, and show us the way and talk to us. We've been yearning for this. And uh, so they got there and they're talking. We had a little bit of small talk and all of a sudden they broke out this big book of products that we could sell for them in their multi-tier marketing program. And I, we were We were shattered. We were shattered because here they have never talked to us. They had never said anything to us about anything about God, anything about the spirit filled life. They had never offered us an ounce of instruction, but they had another agenda. And that's not to be the, the, the man of God. When we are hearing about the Lord's business, it's to be about him. It's not to say that we don't talk and we don't, you guys do. We show favor to the household of faith. But we, as, an, as elders, we have to keep our, our, our pathway straight and our focus prioritized. Notice that it says that he is to be, not be quick tempered. Guzik points out the ancient word here refers to a setter, settled state of anger. Somebody who is always that simmering volcano. Somebody who's always got that little chip on their shoulder. That person who's known to have that edge or that bitterness. You know, that, that person that you, you see coming down the hallway. You go, oh, 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 here, comes, here comes such and such. Let me give them wide berth, you know. And uh, that's, that's that person. Not, don't be that guy. Don't be that guy, but especially as elders, don't be that quick-tempered, uh, you know, guy. Not, notice it says, don't be greedy for gain. The idea being conveyed here is that it's not just, it's just truly, don't be greedy. Not just a lack of contentment, but don't be greedy. You cannot be greedy for gain, not motivated into ministry for gain. The, 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 the eldership, the pastor... There's no place for any of that. And I think we, we see it on, on, on these, you know, mega church websites and YouTube channels and TV. I think if you grew up in the 70s, 80s, 90s, you were used to seeing all these televangelists and these guys who literally do have the gold-plated toilets in their, you know, executive bathrooms and, and the jets and, the, and this, that, and the other. That is not of the, there, there is nothing about that. There, there, if that is your pastor, if that is your elder team, you've really got to examine the scriptures. There's nothing about that, that is at all desirable about greedy gain found here in the New Testament. In fact, if you look at, at the average church just in the United States, just in the, the average church in the United States, you know how many people attend that church? 60 people attend the average church in the United States, you know, depending on what study you've read. And that number's down. Back in my day, it used to be 70. It's down to 60 people attend the average church. The average pastor is working a job in addition to pastoring 
his church. So he's bivocational. He's working 40, 50, 60 hours a week and then trying to scrape together a Bible study and trying to edify the saints for the work of the ministry. He's trying to do the work of an evangelist. His heart is torn. His pennies are being rubbed together. There's nothing sexy about ministry. It is hard work. It is not for gain. You're not to be trying to find a way to fleece the flock and line your pockets and that sort of thing. If that's your heart, get out, stay away. Don't soil the name of Jesus. Do not soil his church. It'll give the church a black eye. And notice that they're also to be hospitable. Again, you know, the, the word in the original language means that you're fond of guests. And that, especially in that day, you know, there was many travelers and strangers that were passing through. Uh, and it would be very necessary that you didn't have a Motel 6 or a Holiday Inn at every corner. So you had to be those who, especially as there would be traveling uh, other you know, saints coming through town, you'd have to be willing to give yourself up. To, to both friends and to strangers. Notice it says, lover of good and self-control. Lover of good and self-control. There's been a number of, uh, of sex scandals that have rocked uh, the church here recently. And, you know, some of those grab our attention. But there's been a few others as it relates to uh, what I've seen is bullying and uh, financial indiscretions. And, and, and people who, pastors and elder teams who behind closed doors, once that door closes, I mean, the voices are raised, fingers are being pointed, you know, insinuations are being made, tables are being slammed because, you know, the elder, the pastor, that big personality wants his way, he wants his thing, and he's going to get it. And, and, and that's not to be. You're to be a lover of good. You're to be self-controlled. Those who, you know, there was one pastor who I, I, I was, I followed intensely and, and loved the ministry, had a very extensive ministry, but was taking money from this pot and moving it just in, you know, just shuffling around, violating protocols, violating uh, things that every institution that would uh, regulate such things would advise against, maybe not against the law, but it was against everything that he had been instructed to do and the rules internally for the church. You've got to love self-discipline. You have to love discipline and you have to be accountable. You have to love good, you know, as it relates to things. Notice that it says he's upright, verse 9, holy and disciplined. The two saddest things for, in my per, this is my personal opinion, two saddest things in all of ministry is a, is a pastor without a clear understanding of their calling and the vision that it takes to clear, to carry it out. But the second, and I'll talk about that later. It, it, the second is, is that, is hypocrisy within the church, especially as it relates to those who uh, are the children of, of, of leadership pastor's kids, uh, elders' children, ministry leaders' kids. To me, there is nothing sadder in the whole world than, than to, to sit down with a young man or young woman and, and, and to, to, to listen to them tell their story, and I hear it not too infrequently, about how they grew up going to church all the time, and, and, and we went to church all the time. But the person my dad was at church is nowhere close to who he was behind closed doors. And there's nothing sadder in the whole world to have a person who lives one way before men and puts on a shining face and shakes those hands. Ah, oh, you doing today, brother? Oh, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. How are you doing? You know, how's your walk going? And, you know, look you in the eye and shake your hand and, and make you feel like, oh, you know, this guy's really spiritual. Only to find out that who he is behind closed doors, he's an animal or he's a, just a carnal Christian that nothing he says was true. It's a farce. There's nothing that will turn children away from the Lord more quickly and, and not only have them turn away from the Lord, but reject Christianity, reject, reject religion all the time. I mean, every 
religion that relates to, to Jesus than that kind of hypocrisy. We are to live upright and holy and disciplined lives. That's who the Lord has called uh, the, the minister of God to be, the leader of his church to be. And notice in verse 9, he said, at the end of verse 9, finally, Paul, he's winding down. He's shot all, he's shotgun uh, blasted us with all these qualifications. And for, in verse 9, he told us to hold firm to the trustworthy word taught so that he may be able to give instruction and in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Hold fast to that word that you've been taught. And they would have to hold fast. Not, they didn't have a canon of scripture. They didn't have the, the Bible as you and I have this. They would have to treasure these things in their heart and pass these things down. Somebody is there trying to memorize things to the best of their ability. That's why they had that thing called the Dadaki, there where there's just a few things that they were had written down that the apostles had, had taught them and, and were instructed. And we're going to pass that around and make sure to, to follow these traditions, these teachings to the best of our ability. Hold fast to those things because you don't have to be a perfect teacher. In fact, you know, when Timothy uh, is addressed by Paul in the pastoral epistles, he, he says that you're to be apt to teach. He didn't say, say anything about being the most talented and winsome preacher in the land. But we're to hold fast. You at least have to be skilled in the word of God and apt to teach. And, and the big picture as we wrap up this particular section and, uh, is, is the idea is that the pastor and the elder, the the Shepherd, the overseer, is a man of impeccable character. You notice that it says nothing. It says nothing about education, certificates, sheepskins. It says nothing about talent. He's not, it didn't say you have to be a 10 talent guy, man. You've got to have a 10 talent leader. You've got to have the most polished. It doesn't say anything about good looks and hair. <laughs> Praise God. It, it, it doesn't say anything about gifting, how gifted you are. It doesn't say anything about business acumen. It doesn't say any of those things. But it does say that you're to be a man of moral character, impeccable character. That is what the Lord's concerned about. I don't know about you guys. I, I you know, followed baseball in the late 80s and 90s. I, I, I kind of gravitated towards it after all of the, the steroid scandals. I just was like, you know what? I'm going to watch football because those guys are all obviously on steroids and they're not lying about it. But be that as it may. But the guys that I love, I love the Bash Brothers. I was an Ace fan. I don't know what it was about the Bay. I guess it was the same. For, I, I'll, I don't have time to go into all those details. But anyhow, uh, I love the Bash Brothers, right? Jose Canseco and Mark McGuire, right? Uh, you know, and, and, and after those guys, you, you know, you had Barry Bonds and Sammy Sosa. We love those guys because they would kill it, man. They would knock the cover off of that ball. And, and those are the guys who just, you know, you loved them until they got busted for steroids. And then I was like, there, you took all my heroes away. All of their stats have big asterisks by them right now, like the Houston asterisks. I mean, Astros, right? I mean, these guys... You, you, you just, who do you value? You've taken all my heroes. But you know those guys who, who, who weren't acclaimed, who I still liked and had an appreciation for, were the guys who were the consistent ones. You remember the Don Mattingly's of the day? You remember the Cal Ripkins of the day? The guys who no matter what, you, what was going to happen, they may not have taken the cover off that ball, but they were going to get on base. They were faithful. They were reliable, men of good character, good team players, men who, who went on and had distinguished careers, not for their flash and, 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 and you know, uh, acclaim for those reasons, but these men were faithful and reliable. And Pastor Joe Foch always describes maturity as long faithfulness in the same direction. And that's what the Lord wants from a, a leader from a bishop, 
from an elder, from a pastor, is long faithfulness in the same direction. That's the mark of maturity. That's the mark of a, of a great teacher. And, and then finally, in, uh, in my first closing, no, it's, this is not my first closing, the final uh, section here, uh, verse 3, uh, chapter uh, 1, verse 10 through 16, and here we have, uh, for the, there were many, who were insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. Verse 12, one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. <laughs> oh my gosh. How would you like to be that town and God send Paul to your town <laughs> and just you get this label? Paul would be canceled. Like Dr. Seuss, Paul would be canceled in a heartbeat. But be that as it may, verse 12, it says, uh, verse 13, this testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be of sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth to the pure all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and consciences, consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. My, oh my. So Paul's telling Titus, your work, you got your work cut out for you. I want you to have a, a realistic job preview there, Titus. I love you, son, but I, I don't want you to, to, to go in, you know, unaware of what you're going to deal with. A couple weeks ago, my son uh, took uh, his, uh, we're going to call her a friend. He took his friend out. They had a, a winter formal that our, our homeschool group puts together. And they went to this restaurant. I'm not going to name the restaurant because I don't want to be labeled as bitter, but he took her to this restaurant. And, uh, you know, the, there's, there he is. They are plainly teenagers. They really, they look it too. They're just so young and it's, they're cute. And it's, but there, he didn't know what to get. He's never been to a fancy restaurant like this before. You know, she ordered the filet and he, he's, I don't know what to get. What should I get? He asked the waitress. Well, you ought to get X, Y, Z, she said. Okay, well, the thing about these menus is there's no prices on them. That's the kind of restaurant he's going to. And she said to his teenager, you should get this particular thing. He, okay, sounds good to me. I'll take it medium and blah, 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 and give me this side and all that. And then all of a sudden the bill came out. His steak was $122. <laughs> He said, cold chills <laughs> went down. He said, I could feel all the blood leaving my face. He said, my lips felt swollen. I did, he, he, I, he panicked. He was like, oh my gosh, how much is in my bank account? What, okay, what am I? And, uh, you know, so he, he said, and we noticed that, you know, we picked him up and drove him around just so they could have a good time and all this stuff. And he was unusually quiet. When we picked him up from the, from the restaurant and we were just wondering what's going on here. And he, he told us later and that sort of thing, you know, you know, I feel bad as a dad. I, I, I didn't do a good job of prepping him. I didn't help give him a realistic preview. I failed you, my son. I'm so sorry. And, and Paul didn't want to make this mistake. He wanted to give Titus a realistic preview of what he was getting himself into as he's heading into Crete. And that he's going to encounter these people. Notice he said they're insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers. These people who would want to derail your ministry. And notice there he says that they must be put to silence. All right. Now keep in mind, he's going to give some instruction on how to silence him. He's not being Paul, the godfather. <laughs> right? He's not. They must be silenced. <clears throat> Vinny, you know. Take them out. You know, that's not the, that's not what he's talking about. He does use the term. The, the term here is muzzled. Silence. Quieted is the is the idea. He'll talk about how to do it here in a moment. He says, because they're upsetting all of the families for shameful gain. 
the things which ought not to be taught. And then he says, look at these cretins, you know, you big cretin, you know, when you hear the term, this is where it comes from. You, you refer to somebody as a cretin. It's because they're liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. And Paul, Paul affirms, he says, this testimony is true. That's who these people are. That's, that's the, the nature of them. And you must rebuke them that they may have sound faith. Devoting themselves, not devoting themselves. And here's where Paul, Paul has an allergic reaction immediately to anybody who is of this mindset. Notice that he says, not devoting themselves to the Jewish myths and the commands of the people who turn people away from the truth. Notice that, it, that that's a reference back to verse 10 where he was referring back to those of the circumcision. If you guys have read the book of Acts, and I know a lot of you have, you know that these are the people who chased, literally chased Paul from town to town. Everywhere he goes, they were following pitchforks and torches, following him everywhere he went. Uh, and, and trying to uh, take away his message, trying to discredit him, trying to stir up trouble and riots and frustration. And guess what? They're even there in Crete trying to, to okay, and it, it, this is what we see in a lot of the cults. They hear of a Christian church going into town. They see doctrine going forward. They see a ministry going in, missionaries coming in, preaching the authentic word of God. And soon as the, the, the stronger, more established missionary and pastor leaves town and has established an elder, here comes the cult with their little magazine, their other set of books and things that, oh, well, have you read the true gospel? We want to share with you and we want to take you further. We want to take you deeper. Let's, let us, and, and under the guise of Christianity and under this guise, it's, well, they're going to try to take them back to the Jewish roots and the rites and the rituals and all of this. And, uh, you know, there's some inference here that there was some things going on about diet, you know, the, the Jewish dietary laws and all of these things uh, that they were trying to bring them under subjection to. And Paul says, listen, to the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him in their works. Their beliefs don't match their behaviors. They say the one thing, but they're doing another. And that's the ultimate form of hypocrisy. That's the ultimate test about any religion. They are detestable disobedient and unfit for any good works. They are disqualified is what Paul is saying here. And in the ancient word, the word that he's using here describes a counterfeit coin, a cowardly soldier who fails in battle, somebody who is rejected from elected office, a, the stone that is rejected by any builder. That's the word he uses for detestable. And, and these things are to be rejected. So uh, you have this realistic preview. The, the heart of God here is that uh, the, the church would be established. Again, it, it, that, that's the whole mindset as you, as you look at this particular chapter. Paul is there instructing Titus to set into order the things that which we're out of order, that we're in chaos, and that there is a, to be a uniformity in God's church. And qualified leadership is one of those things. There's a lot of things that you and I have freedom to do in our life. We may raise our kids differently in some ways, but there's some things that, that come, that, that are very, going to be very common in the way we raise our kids. There may be things that you do differently in your ministry than we do in ours. And that's okay too. That There's supposed to be some commonalities. There's supposed to be some things that are sure, that, that are defined, that are non-negotiables. And as we, as you look at, at this, I just want to share with you guys, you know, I, you don't have to be the flashiest. It's that, you know, churches, they're not meant to be the flashiest. In fact, I think churches that, that are seeking to be the hippest, coolest, most relevant, the most hyped, the mo 
I'm not saying there's anything wrong with hype. I'm not saying there's anything wrong. I'm so glad we have a creative team here. I'm glad Micah is, is, is here on staff helping us with our video production. I'm glad we're able to, to, to do the, the, the things and be, we open up our online uh, you know, audience in the front door of the church home because that's the modern technological age we're in. But I'm glad that we don't have a leadership team that feels the need to have dancing bears and laser lights and, and, and the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. The, the priority of the church is the non-negotiables. It's the authority of teaching God's word. It is the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry that they may go out and accomplish the great commission. That that's our priority. I'm on all kinds of, you know, Facebook teams and boards and I get to see what's going on in the church and I just see all these guys and they get out there and, you know, they've got all these huge props on their set and they're climbing up ladders and guys have water so they can look like they're walking on water like Jesus did. And it's like, that's what they constantly have to think. And they have to constantly think of the newest thing, the, the, the thing that's going to grab people's attention, that's going to entertain, wait to see what my pastor do, doing next. I, I'm so glad that I have a pastor who says, open your Bibles every single Sunday. Turn in your Bibles to such and such passage. We're picking up where we left off last week and instructs us simply that you and I may know the word of God. Is, you know, it's not the next sermon series on how to better your finances, to, to be an overcomer, to, to get along better with your wife. And they sprinkle a little Jesus dust and a few scriptures in there with a lot of modern psychology. It's just a simple instruction from God's word. And you need a man of God who's qualified to do so. And that's the simplicity of it all. Ch church is terribly simple. It's terribly hard to, 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 to do. It, it's, it's, it's terribly hard for, for us to stick to that. But there's nothing sadder to me than a pastor who has lost the vision of holding the helm of the church and steering it in this direction. To mind his character and let God take care of the rest. There's nothing sadder than a church and a pastor and eldership team that has to manufacture ministry, that has to manufacture things to do because they're going to go to every conference and they're going to read every book and that's what they're going to chase after. They're going to go to this conference. You know what we need to do now, church? I've been to this conference and I learned this thing. Oh, it's just the coolest thing ever. We got to do this. And Oh, I just read this book and now we need to do this book thing. And now this new trend is out, the prayer of Jabez or this one and we got to do that. Nothing sadder than a church that has to be uh, accustomed to man's trends. We have, I, I'm, I'm thankful for the tradition of Calvary Chapel and Pastor Mark and what we have here. Well, as we wrap up, I'm going to pray. Now, it was going to be a lot easier to facilitate, you know, some just kind of Q&A discussion time. Uh, from, from the tables there in the other room. But we're going to attempt to do that here in a minute. And I guess I'll just try to facilitate some larger group discussion here from the, from the podium. But let's do this. Let's pray and uh, we'll have some, some time uh, to just talk through some of these things together and then just fellowship and eat some more donuts. Lord, you have been here with us. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this time we've had to set our faces before it, to set our minds, our hearts. Lord, we give to you our lives. Lord, we just lift up to you the, the elder team here. We just pray that you'd keep us, keep uh, them in, in your way. Lord, in, in a time where we're seeing so many headlines of, of pastors who've gone astray, where we see so many churches that are because of one thing or another, because of COVID or because of pastors growing weary and well-doing, have to close their doors or look for another pastor and the church has become beleaguered and, and, and frustrated. We lift up to you the churches this, this morning, Lord, that you would strengthen your bride here in the United States and all over the world. We pray for those who are in leadership, that you'd strengthen them for the work at hand, Lord. We know that you've positioned us 
we know that in this dark time you've lived, you've, you have positioned us to be those who hold sacred these truths, your word, and that we, you've given us the ability by your Holy Spirit to live these things out. So I just pray that you would continue to strengthen those who are in these positions, strengthen your church, strengthen every member, multiply the efforts and the work, multiply our faith, God, and give us faith where we lack. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank <laughs> you.